Hallelujah. Good morning, everyone. Great to be in church this morning as I hobble over here. I'm just getting set up. Just bear with me as Andrew's just getting um, my stuff across. Am I right? Do you want to chair today? No, no, it's fine. It's here. You know, um, we really live in, certainly live in strange times, don't we? Um, who would have thought as we started the year when uh, last July when the Lord put the word on my heart that, um, you know, perceive. What is God about to do and what he's doing? Who would have thought it would have been this? Uh, I certainly didn't. But that, I guess, is part of what seeking God's face. Lord, what are you doing? Strange days indeed that we live in. But remember that even though we don't know the day, even though we don't know the hour, and even though it'll come when we least expect it, our Lord is coming back. Soon, we don't know when, but soon. Our Lord is coming back. And we look forward to that day when we will be with Christ in all eternity and all that we have for those that have a relationship with him. But that's the key, a relationship with God, a relationship with Jesus. Um, and we have to be mindful of that. And, I, and the questions that I, I felt God in this season of fasting for me has been um, that I have just found a new sense again of the awe of God. Uh, during worship and, and I, I, I'm really looking forward to when we can have worship together. I didn't realise how much I missed worship until I was able to sit here last week and, and the team did such a great job this morning. Uh, the anointing was just fabulous and um, the just sitting in the presence of God and, and it's great to have some people in the house here that were able to gather together. Friend Eunice, awesome to see you guys again. So, but our God is good. Um, I remember sitting in hospital and um, I said to Seal that um, we were taught, yeah, sitting in there and I'm realising what's going to happen, who's going to look after everything, how are we going to do it? And uh, of course, uh, the Andrew and the team all stepped up and just did everything. But I, I, I literally thought to myself, yeah, I'll just be away one weekend. <laughs> I literally did. I thought I was going to be Superman. I'll literally be away one weekend, maybe two, and then I'll be back into the swing of things. I'll just get my trusty crutches and I'll hobble around everywhere and I'll do what I need to do. But God had other ideas. And the important thing in every season that we go through is to listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying. What is the Holy Spirit saying to you? What is the Holy Spirit wanting you to grab? And in the midst of this season, I've had to search that too and, and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to me and say, what are we doing for my life, for the church and for everyone? And so, um, yes, we are continuing quickly finishing on Acts chapter 10. And in Acts chapter 10, we have this amazing story. And now we're posing some questions of what oil do we have in our lamp and who, what or more so who are we fixing our eyes on? It's so easy in these days to fix our eyes on other things, to fix our eyes on troubles, to fix our eyes on turmoil, to fix our eyes on what's going to happen here, what's going to happen there. But the Bible encourages us and teaches us to fix our eyes upon Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, Amen. who for the joy uh, for the joy in him that God had placed in him knew endured the cross even unto death, that we could have life and have life more abundantly as we fix our eyes on him. And Acts chapter 10 is an amazing passage. And as we've talked about that, and, and I won't go into the past things apart from just summarize a couple of things. If you want to know, um, have a look at the other messages. And by the way, you can actually go on YouTube as well and type in Momentum Church. All our sermons you can uh, on YouTube as well as on Facebook. But in Acts chapter 10, we have an event that is taking place that is about to change the whole world for the Gentiles. We have something that is going to happen that has never happened in the whole history of the Gentile race. And it's about to happen here. We have a Gentile called Cornelius who has a vision of an angel uh, who's telling him that God is about to do something. And he's the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob is about to make himself known. And he sends his soldiers to, and friends to go to get this Jew called Cephas, whose surname was Peter who Peter at the time had fallen into a trance, uh, suspending the natural or fleshly senses and sees a vision that would shift his paradigm, that would shift his culture. 
We can get so caught up in our culture, so caught up in the religiousness of things, that we have to remember that it's not our culture that counts. It's not my culture that counts. It's not my paradigm that counts. It is what the Lord would have of me. What does God require of me? And we see that Peter was prepared to put his culture on the line. And we see that right through in the middle of Acts, we have Peter, uh, the preaching to Cornelius in the household. And in this, we see a passage of four people in the story. And in everything we do, there are four people in in our stories. There's us, there's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There always is the four people in the story. But the question so often is, who's in the center of that story? And I wanted to pose some questions, and I mentioned this last time in the previous message, But I want to ask you a question this morning again. Three, actually. Could Jesus do miracles because he is God? Yes, of course. Now, I want to say, did Jesus do miracles being fully God? Yes, of course he did. And the third question is, did Jesus do miracles being fully man? Yes, of course he did. And I don't think for Christians, we, don't, we know that Jesus is, is uh, fully God, uh, manifested in flesh in Jesus Christ. We know that. And we don't have an issue with Jesus doing miracles as God because we know that he is God. But do we often see and recognize how Jesus operated in his life as fully man? There's a passage in Acts chapter 10 that um, I want to just hone in on for a second and then I want to share a video later on that really shows us and I know I guess in all this I want us to be focused this morning that Jesus has got to be the center of our story we can get so busy and so full of everything that's happening in life but is Jesus the center of your story I certainly learned that in this past month how much was Jesus the center of my story when I couldn't move and I had to rest? And me, I was saying to Seal yesterday, it's been really difficult for me who's always go, go, go. There is no go, go, go. It's been whoa, whoa, whoa and uh, slow down. And so um, it's learning these things. But we have to think also in the time of Jesus, um, there was a culture. It was one of religiousness where it seemed more important to obey the law instead of understanding why it was there and who gave it. They were more focused on this is the law and this is what you've got to do and that's it. Jesus comes along and he pushes against the culture of what was happening in that time. He pushes against the culture, not to push against the culture, but to show them and bring a revelation in that the eyes are focused on the wrong thing. You were focused on the law and what the law wanted to bring in instead of what our God, what the Father was wanting to bring in and why the law was there. That the law was there to show them that there was a better way of living than the way that the world was living at that time. But people being people, we tend to shift all the paradigm. And of course, Jesus was always opening up himself as well to say that in him, he is the way, the truth and the life. So let's have a look. I don't think any of us have a a problem with understanding that Jesus is God. I mean, John 1 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And I don't think we have an issue. And there are other scriptures that show that. But I want us to look at a few things in the Bible that talk about that we can see what is happening to talk about the culture and Jesus having the story. But quickly, let's have a look at um, Acts chapter 10 and in verse 38. And in verse 38, we read, Peter's preaching the message and he talks about the word that went through our Jesus going through all Judea and beginning from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. And in verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth, not Jesus the Son of God, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the man, how God anointed Jesus the man, I've lost my place, Verse 38, with the Holy Spirit and with power. And of course, we remember that when Jesus was baptized by John, that the heavens opened and a voice came out. This is my beloved son. And they saw what looked like a dove descending upon Jesus. And he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And then it says, and with power and with dunamis power, who went about, Jesus went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed 
by who were oppressed by the devil. And it says something here, for God was with him. Have you ever stopped to wonder and say, so God was with Jesus, but Jesus is God. Why was God with him? Uh, Jesus, I think in this passage, when we will see this connection of Jesus, the deity of Jesus as fully God, but yet fully man. And it was important, it's important for us to understand that Jesus as fully man was able to access and enter in and have the fullness of God that was with him. Because if he was able to do that, church, we're able to do that. That Jesus is fully man. And as fully man, he died on the cross. As fully man, he entered in. As fully man, he also grabbed those keys of death and hell that we are able to partake in everything that he did, everything that he had. For God was with him. In Luke chapter 7, in Luke chapter 7, verses 11 to 16, we have a story of um, Jesus raising the son of the widow of Nain. And it says in verse 11, Now it happened the day after that he went into the city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him and a large crowd. And when he came near the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother. And she was a widow, and a large crowd from the city was with her. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came and touched the open coffin. And those who carried him stood still and he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. No fanfare. Just words. Words with power. Dunamis power. Holy Spirit power. Young man, I say to you, arise. So he who was dead sat up. Could you imagine being one of those people there? He who was dead sat up. And began to speak and he presented him to his mother. It continues to talk about the reaction from all the Jewish people. But what they were seeing here is it says that then fear came upon them and then glorified God saying a great prophet has risen up among us and God has visited his people. And the report of him went throughout all Judea and the surrounding regions. It wasn't unusual, or it wasn't unusual in the culture of the time that they had known people to be raised from the dead. In fact, the two greatest prophets that they considered earlier on, Elijah and Elisha, had did exactly the same thing as Jesus had just done there. They raised the son, the only son of a woman, and raised him back from the dead. Both of them did that. And so they saw the parallel and there was reasoning in what Jesus was doing. He was showing them that he had come and to fulfill all the things of the prophet, of course, and also of the law. But they looked at Jesus as the prophet, the prophet. Uh, and previously I'd said that for the Jewish people, for the culture to think that a Messiah was going to come, that was going to set them free, that was going to redeem them, wasn't a problem. Because they believed that someone was going to help them and set them free from the Romans. But the concept that a man could come to earth as fully God and call himself equal with God was just blasphemous. It was just in, impossible to do that someone could say they had this personal relationship with this invisible God. It could be so foreign. But Jesus was coming through, and we know in the, in the life of Jesus how he went through this time. And now I want us to turn and have a look at um, a story that we know where Jesus was walking through the water in Matthew chapter 14. In Matthew chapter 14, we have this passage where Jesus had they fed the 5,000. Jesus had gone up to the mountain to pray and be with the Father. And we all know that you know Jesus spent more time in relationship with the Father. He spent more time alone with the Father than he did in his ministry. That the backbone of everything he did was his prayer and his relationship with the Father. And that gives us an indicator of what we need to do in our prayer time. But Jesus, the disciples had started to cross the sea. Uh, we know that they were struggling to get across. And Jesus, of course, walks across the water and they see him in the third watch. And it was between three and six o'clock in the morning. And I guess we can't be too harsh on the disciples. And just imagine if you're out in the boat fishing early in the morning, you know, three, four, five, six o'clock. And you're in the middle of this torrential storm and you see someone walking across the water. I don't think there'd be any bloke that would say, I oh, know, that's cool. That's cool. 
I think we'd panic. I think we'd probably be like the disciples and scream out, ah, what's going on? It's a ghost. Um, that what Jesus was showing in this passage is really amazing and sometimes we don't stop to look at it uh, quite as much. We see the indicator that Jesus is showing here how he is fully God and fully man. Jesus, first of all, he calls out to his disciples and when they, he says, it is I. Now Jesus doesn't say, it's Jesus. He doesn't say, it's your master. It's your rabbi. It's Jesus of Nazareth. He calls out the word ego. And he says, it is I, not ego in the sense of what we think, but ego. And he starts to use the word that they knew was synonymous with I am. So he says, I, I am here. I am the one who is calling out to you. Another indicator we see was that Jesus walked upon the water. And for us in, in a Western culture, we don't think much apart from that would be pretty cool to walk upon the water. But Jesus was actually showing his disciples a Old Testament theophany, you know, a theophany, a visible manifestation of the humanity of God here amongst us. He was showing them an Old Testament theoph theophany from Job chapter 9, where it says, Who tramples the waves of the sea? But Yahweh. So he says, It is I, I am in here. And then he says, he shows them, and they understood that only Yahweh is the one who can trample upon the waters, and they would have knew, known that. And of course, the third indicator that we see is when he hops into the boat and the storm gets still, and the disciples say, truly, you are the Son of God. Mm. I think it's really important for us to remember as we build and grow in our relationship with Christ, that he is fully man, but he's the Son of God. He is the Son of God in all that he has. Uh, it's a profound revelation of Jesus' divine power on the sea and what he's doing. But I think we have to remember that Jesus used his human feet to walk on the water. He used his human voice to tell him, it's I. He used a human hand to grab Peter and lift him up. He used his human legs to hop into the boat, to tell the storm to be calm. So we see this, both aspects of Jesus working together. I wonder if the disciples, I wonder if Peter, James and John thought of what had happened on the water when only a few chapters later, they're up on the mountain and they see the transfiguration of Jesus, where they see Jesus transform with the others around him. But he's showing something here. And I guess what I want us to be mindful of is that we have the fullness of God that is ready to come into our now. When we focus on Jesus as the author of our faith, as the center of everything we do. You know, Philippians 2 tells us in that first part of the verse, in verse 5, in your relationships with one another, have the mindset of Christ, mm. who being the very nature of God, do not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And for us, it's an encouragement, an example that we would take and have the same mindset of Christ to be nothing but slaves to Christ, to be nothing but obedient to the call of God in our lives. Who is at the centre of the story? Jesus went about his whole life on earth. He only did what the Father told him to do. But he knew that in everything he did, because he had a relationship with the Father, God was with him. I was sharing, I may have said this before, that when I did fall into the water after the accident, and I realised what had happened and I broke my leg, and the moment I realised I broke my leg, Panic just set in. Uh, I, I was really in turmoil. I, I panic set in and I thought I was going to die. And everything happened so quick. I don't know how long it was for. But I had to compose my thoughts. And I remember saying, Lord, no, Lord, it's not my time. You are with me. And I kept saying that. And I said it to Danny later on. God's with me. God's with me. God's with me. We can forget so much in what we do. God is with us. And we need to keep reminding ourselves, no matter how great it is, no matter how tough it is, God is with us. Uh, 
one of the people I like listening to at times is um, a guy called Canon J. John. And I've said this quote before, but he said, we can alter our past. We can't, sorry, we can't alter our past, but we can put our past on the altar. In Acts 10, we see Cornelius and Peter who understood the culture of their lives. Two totally different cultures, a Western and an Eastern culture. But they recognised that God was about to do something. The Almighty God, the fa- God, the Father of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, was about to do a new thing, even if they didn't understand it. And yet they both decided to put God in the centre of their world, God to be in the centre and be obedient to what they're doing and be obedient to the leading. I want us to just look at a video now. So Isaac, oh, by the way, if you ever see Isaac, give him a big thank you because he is doing an amazing job here with all the stuff that we got. So can we just play this video now? And he's building it. If yeah. we, we make the disciples, he'll, he'll take use that material of, then to build his church. He'll take care of it. That's unbelievable. I um, When I think of that, Jossie, um, you have these... Uh, discipleship houses now training centers yeah. where these young leaders come and they stay yeah um, tell me about the young leader that um, that didn't qualify to get in the house oh yeah um, well we have certain criteria that we've kind of set mm-hmm. and um, you know uh, who can come in and but this guy came to Jesus and see the difference there is when somebody comes to Jesus, they are not coming to become a church member. Yeah. They are becoming workers they, mm. because they are the church. Yeah. And they become a disciple and then become a church planter because they see themselves as not church members. Yeah. And I think whereas in the West, when somebody becomes a Christian, they become a church member. So this guy, his dream was to plant a church. So he applied and in the interview process found out he couldn't read and write. He was illiterate. So they said, sorry, you don't meet our criteria, Can't be, out. Yeah. Yeah. But he wouldn't, he wouldn't quit, he just kept coming back. But I need to plant a church because that's what Jesus wants us to do. That's what we live for. That's what you guys are teaching all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, but they just said, but our policy is this. And finally he went and sat in, the, in one of our discipleship you know, training homes and said, I'm not leaving. I'm, I'm just staying here. He just came in a class and said, I'm not getting up. I'm not getting up. I'm, I'm, I'm just staying here because <laughs> I, need to, I need to plant a church. What happened? Um, well, the leader's heart was you know, melting and he talked to him and said, look, I cannot put you as an official student because it's against the policy. Uh, but here's what we'll do. We'll let you stay, uh-huh. but you won't be on the list. You will not graduate. And, you know, we give them a church planting kit, like a bicycle, a carpet, Uh drum, Uh tamarind, Bibles, you know, um, it's about $550, um, all the tools to plant a church. He said, you won't get that. And then to pioneer the work, we give them financial help, you know, he said, you don't, you're not going to get that. And if you would agree to all of that, you can remain. You can stay in the class. Okay. And he said, yeah, that's fine. Okay. So he did. Finally, the graduation comes, all his friends, 22 friends that he's been, spent a year with. Because he stayed faithful and he was there. All the time. The whole he time. He stayed there for one year. Graduation day. Day, all his 22 friends are all dressing up and marching out and he's, he just has to sit out there. Um, this is my organization that I lead. <laughs> where was love? You know, where right, was right, love? Right, right. That's brutal. So he's sitting there watching his friends graduate. Graduate and get their certificates. And then we, we have a very, I think one of the most beautiful times of graduation is the commissioning prayer where they kneel down, dedicating their life. And they literally all join hands together and yeah. take a vow of martyrdom. Even if we have to die, we'll die for Jesus. They take a vow of martyrdom. That's not required by us, but all our students, they just do that. that. Because that's what Jesus asked. And um, so when they were just getting ready, kneeling down for this, you know, the commissioning prayer, um, he went and said to the pastor, I need to be with them. Would you pray for me? as you pray for them so he and he just knelt down he just came right and there he just get just... himself in there and knelt down 
And again, the leader had, you know, no God, so they, you know, let him stay there. He had some compassion. Compassion, yeah, that's it. So, yeah, so the love came. The love came. The love came. So they laid hands on him. They laid hands on him. But he didn't get a certificate. Nothing. Didn't get a bike. Nothing. Didn't get any of the other stuff. And gone. And they leave. Yeah. So now, because he was not on our system, we don't hear anything. Mm -hmm. But later on, we found out what was happening was those 22 guys that he was in training with. His classmates. His classmates, the cohort that he was with. They were collecting the money that we were giving them. Uh -huh. They will share and collect it together and give it to him. And give it to him. That's love. Wow. And one of the guys, you know, said, "Look, I'm, you know, I, I can do without a bicycle and the church planting kid. Um, here it is. They gave so it they to gave him. him the bike. So they were pooling together, together extra to, money. Yeah, to help him. To and they will go and help him with the church planting efforts. And they because they meet together every month. They're praying. They're helping." And again, that's just the love that, you know, because living together, relationship is shaped. And so fast track, I'm, I'm not hearing any of this, okay? I'm at a conference and our leader comes and says, hey, you got to meet this guy and hear his story. And says, this is six years after that commissioning prayer. So six years later. Yeah. And um, he said, I want you to meet this young guy. He has actually planted 42 churches in the last six years. 42 churches in the last six, six years. years. This was the kid that this didn't the, get the certification, didn't get the money. Absolutely. Wow. And doesn't stop there. He had discipled and released 24 full-time workers to take care of those churches. And didn't send them to the to the discipleship house or training program. He and just I, did and it I see why not. He's yeah, like, y'all, because y'all probably can't get in there. <laughs> but I got all the tools. Yeah, I'm just going to do this with you. And he discipled how many workers? 22? 24. 24 that in, are in now that running years. those churches. Yeah. In six years. In six years. I need to get up now and go disciple somebody. I feel like I'm back. <laughs> I thought I was doing good. Oh my but, God. But, that's amazing. But more than that, he said he had baptized 1,040 people. He had baptized 1,040 people. It's not hands up, it's baptized believers. He said not hands up. Not just hands up and a, and a prayer, it's just, you know. These, these are good old fashioned dunks. Absolutely. Y'all didn't Abs went under. Absolutely. Oh, wow. And then, more important, doesn't stop there. In his village, there is no school because that's why he was illiterate and, you know, there was no school. So he felt the need because again in the training he heard about how we need to be reaching out to the community and taking care of all the needs. And yeah. So he said, I'm going to start a school. So he started a school and he had a school with 230 kids. He had a school with 230 kids? Absolutely. He was illiterate. Did he? Yeah. Did he learn how to? Well, that's exactly. I thought so. I'm hearing this. And so now he said, tell me the miracle of how God taught you to read and write. And he goes, no, God didn't teach me to read and write. And I said, you, you are the, the leader of the school? He said, yeah, I'm the director of the school. I said, how? He said, because I started it. So, <laughs> <laughs> he said, if you want to be a director of anything, go just and start, start it. it. Just that's, start it. That's the story of my life. Yeah, just, <laughs> just start it. So. Wow. And it was just so beautiful. So how did, he, how did he work that out? How did he work out? reading and understanding and yeah he he, um, he has his daughter who can read and write uh -huh. she sits and reads the bible wow and he memorizes the scriptures wow and when i met him i said how much have you memorized is it only half only up to half of the new testament unbelievable and then he has a tree out in the in in the village that he would go and climb on the tree and sit there meditating on that scripture that he's memorized and asking god God, what does this mean for me and my people? Wow. And he just listened to the wow. Holy Spirit to speak to him. Wow. He said, I just come back and tell them. And I hear God speak and I just come back and tell the people. Jasky, that's amazing. Yeah.
he memorizes half of the New Testament. Half of the New Testament is Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and part of Acts. Half of the New Testament. Testament. There's some things that this disciple did, and, and one of them as I close in this, and we'll, I'll talk about this guy a bit more next week, and uh, we look at aspects of what he's doing, because I, I won't do justice to what um, this guy was able to do. But if we look back at Acts chapter 10, and we realise that this unnamed disciple, I'm sure Pastor Jossie knows who he is, but this unnamed disciple had learned to put Jesus in the centre of his story. Nothing was more important to him than Jesus. Nothing was more important to him than following God and living a life for God. He wasn't satisfied to sit on the back bench. I mean, if you can't read or write, it'd be easy to just sit back and say, I'll just be one of the followers. But he wasn't satisfied to do that. And what it shows us is that there really isn't an excuse for the call of God and following the call of God in our lives. Because we have this urgent push within us that every person, I believe, every human being has this call of God that is placed inside us. And if we allow the Holy Spirit to breathe upon that call, to work upon that call, it would flourish and grow if we let it go that way. And it's not based upon what we think sometimes. I think this season has shown us that church isn't looking like what it used to look like. And perhaps it may not look like that for a while. We don't know what's going to happen with the hall. We don't know when we can get back into a hall. Um, I'm sure it'll probably happen next month to some degree. And I'm looking forward to that. Of course, I'm looking forward to that and to see everyone again. But I think what's more important in this season is where is Jesus in your life? And perhaps this morning you don't know Jesus. Perhaps you don't have that relationship with Jesus and don't have an understanding. Perhaps you've grown up in the church and grown up with the Lord, but you don't have that relationship with Christ that would make part of you want to move and burn for him and run to him and grow with him and be in him. Does Jesus consume your thoughts? Does he consume your life? Is he the be all and end all in you? There truly isn't people. There is not any life outside Jesus Christ. That he brings the fulfillment in every single thing we can do. He brings joy, peace, hope. He brings encouragement. He builds us up in every way. He is the one that strengthens and moves us through. He binds us together. There is nothing more important than our God. And I want to encourage everyone this morning. Just keep searching him as we end our fast today. And I look forward to... The next fast, it's going to be a 15-day fast that we in October. But that we focus on Christ in all that we do. Share the good news. Let people know Jesus is alive. So I just want to pray this morning and just speak blessing on everyone. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your word. I thank you, Father, that your word declares that you were with Jesus. And if you were with Jesus, you were with us. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your obedience and your sacrifice. As, as Peter shared a great communion message and knowing the fullness of what you did. And Holy Spirit, that you bring comfort. And we think of Acts chapter 10. And we think, Lord, Holy Spirit, that at the end of Acts chapter 10, it says, while Peter was still speaking, that you, Holy Spirit, fell upon those who heard the word and those of the circumcision who believe were astonished and as many came with you we thank you holy spirit for the outpouring of of yourself upon the gentiles of yourself upon the whole world that shifted and changed a culture from that day forward the world was never the same and Lord, my prayer is even from this day, from this day in 2020, that the world would never be the same because a people, a remnant would rise up and say, Lord, fill our lives afresh, that we can walk in the fullness of you, powering forward with the things you have, obedient to your word, obedient to the fullness of you and carrying all that you have that brings life, leading people into discipleship, into relationship with you, Lord Jesus. I just speak your blessing. And you're covering upon everyone for a great week in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a blessed week. See you on Tuesday night or Thursday night. And whatever you're doing this week, I really want to encourage you to pause and stop. Is Jesus the center of your story? Are you checking the oil in your lamp to make sure that it's the oil of the Holy Spirit? 
and are your eyes fixed upon Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Amen. Be blessed. Amen.